Can't break the tank. Can't break the tank. Can't break the tank. Uh, we're up breaking windows. This thing is so freaking light. It's not gonna damage anything. It's so quiet that like nobody's gonna bother me. This thing checks all the boxes that I was looking for. I'm absolutely loving this frame. I'm probably switching to this full time. I don't really. Think I'm absolutely them. loving this. It's so great. Hello, guys. It's almost time to go again. <laughs> What's up everybody, welcome to Rotor Riot. I'm Let's Fly RC, and today I'm gonna to show you how to build my new drone frame, the Tank S. A lot of people have been asking me what the S stands for. Originally, I meant for the S to stand for sport, like a sports car, but it can also stand for speed, small, or even super duper spectacular. It's not mini, it's not tiny. A lot of my friends wanted to call it tiny tank or mini tank, but those names sounded fragile or weak, and this is a bando basher that can take a beating just like its bigger brother. Don't let me hear you call it a mini tank or a tiny tank, because I'll find you. I have a video over on my Let's Fly RC YouTube channel that explains why I did what I did when designing this drone, so if you want to learn more about it, go and check that out. But today I'm going to show you how I would build this drone in my prospect configuration so that you can build it just like I would. Let's get started with the build. The first thing I wanna mention is that the entire formula is important when designing this drone. From the motors, to the flight controller, to the carbon fiber frame, to the battery, every piece of this recipe is important. If you change any one piece on this drone, you'll probably have a different experience. Let's go over the parts I chose to use for this build. We'll start with the frame. This is the Tank S frame, and in the frame you'll get the carbon fiber pieces with all the screws and mounting hardware, and a universal camera mount. Now this camera mount will work with all of these different video systems from DJI to Avatar to analog uh, and they have different mounting screws and allows you to do custom angles. You can easily adjust your camera angle as needed. As an alternative, I have all these different 3D printed mounts that have protection included. But because of the way that these are designed, I have to make a different mount for every single camera angle in order to be able to have this bumper protection. I highly recommend using one of these mounts if you plan on bashing this drone like I do because this will keep your camera protected better. Also another optional accessory you can pick up for this drone that will make it even more durable are these 3D printed arm protectors. They make a huge difference on strength of the frame and make it last a lot longer. I've designed camera mounts in every angle all the way from 0 degrees all the way up to 50 degrees. They're all available on my Thingiverse. You can download them for free and print them yourselves. The mount that will come with my Prospect build and the one that we will sell in the Rotorite store is the 15 degree mount because that's what I use and that's what I recommend. Another optional accessory that I've designed are these couch mounts for the different video systems. I've got couch mounts for the Waxnail V2, Moonlight, DJI Vista, and DJI O3, and they all have receiver mounts integrated underneath to allow for easier installation. These mounts make the build process go so much faster and it also protects your video transmitter in the event of a crash. The flight controller I chose to use is the Diatone Mamba Mark IV. You'll also need an XT30 pigtail because the Diatone Mamba comes with an XT60 cable and we need an XT30 for the batteries that I chose to use. I fly my Tank S with the DJI controller so that I don't have to have additional unnecessary components. But if you wanna use a long range system such as Crossfire or ELRS, I have thought about that too. These mounts have an integrated solution to allow you to mount your different types of receivers, whether it be FR Sky, ELRS, or Crossfire. And we'll go over that later in the build. Another item that you'll need for the build are these linear antennas because they are much lighter than the standard antennas that come with these systems and they mount very nicely into my integrated mounts. With these mounts, you will never break an antenna. They're completely out of the prop line and they're away from danger, as you can see right here on the build because of the location that I've placed it and it just seamlessly integrates into this design and makes the build so much easier. Also, another thing to mention about these antennas is that I am still getting 95% of the range that I was getting with the standard stock antennas for the DJI O3 system, for example. So it's not really killing my range or penetration. This drone carries the O3 camera and air unit, which allows me to upload to YouTube just like it did before with high quality 4K footage. And the last thing, of course, is my new Let's Fly RC motor. I spent a lot of time prototyping and bash testing these motors to make sure that they are going to be not only durable, but perform amazing, and they pack a punch. Now that I've shown you everything on the bench here and what's included and what you can purchase optionally, let's get right into the build. The frame kit comes with all the carbon fiber pieces, the aluminum cage, camera mount, 
all of the mounting hardware and screws, and the TPU universal camera mount. When building this frame, I totally recommend using Threadlocker to lock the screws in place because a lot of vibration happens in flight and it'll keep your frame together and keep the screws from loosening up. I wanna show you a new technique today that we're using here at the Rotor Riot store that our master builder Bernard showed me recently. It's a great way to make sure that you put just the right amount of thread locker on each of the screws so that you don't over cake the threads with thread locker and put too much on there. Definitely use blue thread locker and not red thread locker because red thread locker is permanent. Let's open this package up and get to the build of the frame. There's three bags of screws. These are the motor screws. They're the smallest of all the screws. I generally don't even use these, but I included them just in case you didn't get my motors with your build. They are the right length of screw to go through the arm, but I won't even be using these in this build. I will use the screws that came with the motors instead. We're gonna set aside the stack screws for now. We'll use those later. And we're gonna open up the bag of screws that has the standoffs in it. This bag has the frame hardware, the screws that we're going to need to mount the frame together. There are two different sizes of standoffs. We've got a 25 millimeter standoff and we have two 20 millimeter standoffs. This is going to be used later to put the cage together and we're going to also pull out the two longest screws that are in this bundle of screws and set those aside because those will be used for the standoff that mounts the cage together in the next steps. There are two lengths of screws in this kit. We're going to go ahead and separate those out into the shorter and longer lengths. We're going to take our two millimeter hex driver out and we're going to take the second longest screws. This should be a nine or a 10 millimeter screw depending on what kit you purchased. The first screw you want to install is the center screw. And as I said before, I'm going to dip my Q-tip into the thread locker. You only need enough where you can barely see it on the threads. If you put too much thread locker, as I said before, you won't ever be able to get these frames apart. So we're going to go ahead and take our first screw and go right up through the center hole of the stiffener plate on the bottom. I'm going to thread that one screw right into the center hole of the mid plate and just loosely put it in there so that we have plenty of room to be able to slide our arms in. We'll line it up just like that so that all the holes line up and match up. And then we're going to take our first arm and we're going to slide it in so that the holes line up to the holes in the mid plate. So we'll put it in this orientation here so that this hole lines up to the 20 by 20 stack holes in the center there. On the very tip of this arm, there is a slot that notches into the center screw so that the arm goes into the right position. And once we have that locked in place, we can squeeze it together. We're gonna to go ahead and slide in our second screw right through the arm. So if you did this properly, once you screw this screw in, this arm should not be able to wiggle back and forth. It should be locked in place with that center notch in place. We're gonna keep that center screw loose. I didn't crank this all the way down, but I have got it fairly tight so that it doesn't move. After we've installed that arm, repeat the process with the other three arms. Now that you have all four screws in place along with the center screw, you should not be able to move the arms back and forth and it should be nice and tight. Once you've got them all in place and they're not rotating, you can go ahead and crank down the center screw and similarly crank down the rest of the four screws nice and tight. After all five screws are tight, you definitely have a super stiff frame. In a future step, we'll be adding this camera cage, but for now, to keep me from losing these screws, I'm just gonna go ahead and thread them in place and I'm just gonna set it aside over here. We will come back to the remainder of the frame build after we have the stack in place with all the wire soldered to the motors. So next we're gonna go ahead and install our stack screws. These are the stack screws included in the kit. You may decide to use the longer screws or the shorter screws for your stack. I'm gonna go ahead and use the shorter screws for this build because it makes it easier to slide the battery strap through whenever we wanna mount our battery and it saves a little bit of weight as well. We're gonna take our 1.5 millimeter hex driver we're going to use four of these screws for stack mounting and the stack mounts in a diamond configuration. You can also use 20 by 20 mount if you want to use your own custom flight controller. But as I was saying before, the whole package is important. So I recommend using the flight controller that I've tested and used for this drone for the last six or seven months now. I like to use these nylock nuts on the bottom of the stack to keep these screws from loosening up over time. They're a little bit more difficult to install, but with these nylock nuts, as I was saying, the stack screws will not loosen up over time and they'll be nice and securely locked to the frame. If you don't have these nylock nuts, the nylon nuts will work just fine. I used those for seven months without any problems, except after a lot of crashes, those nylon nuts will start to loosen up. Go ahead and repeat the process with the other three screws. The next step is to get our flight controller ready. We're gonna go ahead and pre tin the pads on the flight controller and get that ready for installation. And then we're gonna go ahead and mount the motors and solder them up. All right, this is the Mamba Flight Controller AO Stack. In the package, you've got a whole bunch of gummies, some with slots and some without. Capacitor, we're not gonna use this XT60 or power lead. 
And then this is the video transmitter lead that will work with the DJI 03 air unit if you choose to use this one. Before we start tinning the pads, I'm gonna go ahead and place these gummies without the slots on the standoffs just so that I don't lose them. Because we're gonna use those to space up the stack away from the carbon fiber frame. And it gives it a little bit of cushion so that it can perform properly without a lot of vibration. I'm gonna set this aside and then we're going to install the slotted gummies into the flight controller. I like to use the 1.5 millimeter hex driver to push it in. It makes it a little bit easier to get it in there without damaging it. Just be careful not to damage them. The capacitor may or may not be needed for this. I have built them with and without the capacitors and haven't really seen any effect on flight performance by not having a capacitor. I'm gonna go ahead and show you how to install it with a capacitor just in case. We're gonna place it on the flight controller in a way that it sets on the frame in the right position to be mounted down. I integrated some slots for zip ties up here so that I could mount the capacitor right on the edge, right about here. These leads break very easily in a crash and I wanted to make sure that this is locked down with a zip tie and double-sided tape if I do install it on the frame and it keeps it from breaking off and flying off in a crash. I'm gonna snip them off flush with the solder pads. Once I have them the right length, I can tin the ends and install it onto the flight control board. I'm gonna set my soldering iron to 400 degrees for this step because power wires and motor wires are typically thicker than the wires you're gonna use for your receiver. Whenever you're doing receiver wiring, you should probably have the soldering iron set to about 300 degrees Celsius. But for right now, I'm gonna set the soldering iron to 400 degrees Celsius and I'm gonna tin the leads on the capacitor and I'm gonna tin all the leads I'll be using on the flight controller for the power and the motor wires. So let's go ahead and get these tinned up right now while I have the soldering iron hot. I tin all the leads around the edge for the motors and the power wires as well. When soldering, it's to get a good hot solder joint, it's always good to make sure that your solder joints are shiny little balls, just like this. Um, you don't wanna have a solder joint that is dull or has a point such as that because that's gonna end up creating a cold solder joint. The solder we sell in the Rotorite store has flux built into the solder and it will help to make sure that you have a nice clean solder joint. If for some reason your solder joint doesn't look right, just add more solder and at the same time you'll be adding more flux which will help with the adhesion to the solder pad. When trimming and placing this capacitor, it's important to note that the white stripe on the capacitor is the negative side. Be sure to put that negative side on the negative pad of the flight controller when soldering it on. All right, so I'm just gonna go ahead and get the capacitor mounted in place with the positive and the negative terminal. I don't wanna have too much of this sticking over into the IC circuit that's behind there. So I'm gonna make sure that I pull it out far enough to where these leads are just barely on the pad, but they're not pressing in too far where they might end up shorting out an IC chip in the future. Once I get the leads about where I want them to be, I'm gonna put a little bit of extra solder on each pad one at a time and ball it up high enough to where when I go to put my power leads on, I have plenty of solder to adhere to. If you do it one at a time, you shouldn't have to worry about the capacitor falling off. If it looks like that, you did it right. Next, I'm gonna go ahead and wire up the XT30 lead. Depending on your needs, you can cut this shorter or longer. I typically cut it to where it just barely pokes out the top of the top plate so that I can attach my battery to my lead and press it down in the hole after I attach the battery. And it gets it out of the way of the props and keeps it from getting damaged in a crash. I'm gonna place this flight controller where it goes. It's going to sit in the frame in this orientation. The lead's gonna stick up through the top plate about there. I want my negative on this side and my positive on this side because that's how they're gonna lamp to the terminals. And I'm gonna cut the lead flush up against the solder pads with just about that much length. I'm gonna put my thumb here to mark it and snip it with the snips. And one lead's gonna be a little bit longer than the other just because of the location on the flight controller as you can see here. Now that I've cut the leads to the right length, I'm gonna go ahead and strip the leads off tin them up and solder them to the flight controller. With the positive on top of the positive pad, I'm gonna go ahead and press down with a soldering iron to join the two pieces. This is what it should look like when you're finished. Be sure that your black and your red wires do not have any adjoining solder that connect them together or you'll have a bad day. Moving on, next step. Look at these cute little motors. Oh wait, you're not. don't let me catch you calling my motors cute now. 
These things are awesome. Now look at the detail. Oh my gosh, the amount of detail they put into that anodizing. Oh my gosh. I recommend, as I said before, I recommend using the screws that came with my motors versus the screws that came with the frame kit for extra durability. In the motor screw package, you should have three different lengths of screws. There should be two of the longest length screw and that's gonna be used to mount your propellers. So we're gonna take out the two longer screws and set them aside for later when it's time to mount the propellers. The second longest screw is the screw we're going to use to mount the motor. And the shorter screws are not used for this build. We'll go ahead and use these four screws, put some thread locker on them and mount the motors to the frame. Just a little bit of thread locker is all that's needed. These screws should be the right length so you don't have to worry about screwing into the motor windings, but it's always good practice to pay attention to the screw length and how far you're screwing them in so that it doesn't end up hitting the motor winding. It's a good idea to go ahead and put them all in loose first and then tighten them all down once all four are installed. Now that all four screws are inserted lightly, we'll go ahead and crank them down in a cross configuration. There we go. Go ahead and do the same for the other three motors. Now it's time to solder the motors to the flight controller. When I'm trying to determine the right motor wire length, I generally just place it down with my finger along the arm and I make sure that I have a little bit of extra slack for maintenance. Right, so I line it up, give myself a nice bend right here at the bottom of the flight controller, and then snip it flush with the leads. If you just snip one of the wires, you can make them all match because all the wires on this build will be the same length. And then you can just pull them up straight and snip the remaining two wires to the same length. Next, we're going to strip and tin those leads and solder them onto the flight controller. That's how your solder joints should look right there. Very nice. I'll repeat that on the other three motors. <laughs> now that we have all the wires soldered up for our motors, I like to put electrical tape holding these wires down on the arms rather than zip ties because eventually the zip ties snap as they get brittle in a crash where the electrical tape will stay in place. So I use 3M Super 33 plus electrical tape. It's the only electrical tape you should be using. <laughs> it's more expensive, but when you use it, you'll see why. All right, let's just wrap some of this around the arm right about here. And this will keep the wires from getting chopped up by the propellers. All right, moving forward. I typically run the video transmitter cable over top of the flight controller because if you run it under the flight controller, then you have to try to lift all this up and slide it underneath. It's very difficult. Or you have to put it underneath ahead of time. If you've ever gotten one of these camera cables hot with a soldering iron, you'll know that they don't take any heat whatsoever. You don't want to drop a solder ball on this. You don't want to touch it or come anywhere near it with a soldering iron where this cable is done and you'll have to be replacing it with a new one. So that's typically why I just run it over top of the stack whenever I put it on here and maybe secure it with a zip tie and one of these extra holes that I have over here on the front of the frame. And that'll keep it from getting chopped up by the propellers. Just a little quick tip that I've found helps a lot in the build process. Since everything's done here, I'm going to go ahead and put four nylon nuts along the top here. And if you don't really care about the weight that much, you could technically use four nylock nuts with the metal as well, and that'll hold it in place even better. But it should be fine with the nylon nuts as long as those bottom ones are keeping the stack screws from moving. You should be fine with a nylon nut. The way that I put these on is I press down on the flight controller and crush the gummy just a little bit as I'm putting this on, and that way... I don't have to damage the gummy by turning the nut on top of it. It will it'll make it easier to put this nylon nut on there. And then also there's a smooth side and a pointy side to this nut. You wanna put the pointy side down. The pointy side will grip the gummy and it will help to prevent the nylon nut from coming loose. You see I have the points facing down and the rounded side up. That's how you should orient it, and that will keep the nylon nut from loosening over time. If you just do that, use your finger to tighten it down, then you don't need any special tools. And you can regulate your gummy squish depending on how tight you make that nut. I want to push the other ones down. I'm going to try to match them to have the same distance of thread showing on all four screws. If you crush the gummy too much, then you kind of defeat the purpose of having the gummy there in the first place. The job of the gummy is to resist vibration. And if you crush it, then you take away all of its springiness or you make it more compressed than it was designed to be. Just try your best to make sure that the thread distance on all four screws is about the same and that you're not over squishing the gummies on the bottom. Should look about like that when it's done. Uh, before we go any further, I want to go ahead and put some double-sided tape and a zip tie on this capacitor. 
I like to use the very high bond Scotch 3M tape for this. Just cut off a little section about that big. And it helps if you wrap it around the capacitor rather than sticking it to the bottom first because this will just help it to adhere better and stay on longer. All right, now I'm gonna line this up so that I can still get my zip tie through the holes here. When I place, when I place a double-sided tape down, I'm just gonna make sure that I still have access to the zip tie holes. In my testing, I didn't notice any difference in flight performance with or without the capacitor, so you may or may not wanna put the capacitor, that's up to you, but I'm putting it on there just in case. Comes with it in the package, so probably means they want you to use it, so we'll go ahead and put it on there. These are little four inch zip ties, and I usually just put one around the capacitor, right about here. All right, it should look like that when you're done. Very nice. The Tank S is backwards compatible with a lot of different mounts from the Tank 2. For example, the Ghost mount and the Crossfire and ELRS mount are the same, and they both mount to the rear standoffs on the bottom here. And depending on which receiver system you're using for the Tank S, you'll use the corresponding mount. I'm gonna demonstrate a couple of these receiver installations to you so you can kind of get an idea how I would go about installing them if I were using them. So I've got the Crossfire receiver. This is the Nano SE. This is a FR Sky RXSR receiver and the Radio Master RP1. These are all great receivers. I've also got a Foxier receiver here for ELRS as well. But before we do the mounting of these receivers, we need to solder up the wire connections. They should all solder up very similarly with the exception of the RXSR, FR Sky receiver. I'm gonna demonstrate how to wire up the digital receivers such as Crossfire and ELRS in this video. You wanna have your soldering iron set to about 300 degrees Celsius for this because 400 is a little bit too high for these little pads. Our instruction manual for the Mamba Mark IV says that we are supposed to use these four pads right here for our receiver. So we're gonna follow the instructions here and solder it to those four pads our power, ground, transmit, and receive wires. All right, we're gonna use these four pads right here. One, two, three, four. This fifth pad here is for spectrum. It's a 3.3 volt pad and we don't wanna use that one. So according to the manual, this is our five volts, our ground, our RX, and our TX. Whenever you're wiring up a receiver, the RX from the receiver goes to the TX of the flight controller and the TX of the receiver goes to the RX of the flight controller. I'm going to show you how to wire up the Radio Master. And the Crossfire should wire up the same. Just got to match up your RX and TX properly. Even though these wires come pre-tinned, it's always a good idea to go ahead and put your own fresh solder on there because the pre-tinning is done with lead-free solder and we use leaded solder because it works easier with our electronics. I'm going to go ahead and pre-tinned the pads on the receiver and get those four wires wired up in accordance to the way that Radio Master wants us to wire them. So we'll start with negative. On the outside, and positive, five volts is the next one. <laughs> I like to make my white wire RX on my receiver because Joshua Barwell did a video like that with Crossfire a long time ago, and ever since then, I have made all of my receivers the same color scheme. If you wired up your receiver properly, it should look like this. If you're using the RP1 ELRS receiver from Radio Master. Normally, I suggest routing your antenna wire like this on most ELRS and Crossfire receivers because this keeps this wire from getting ripped off in a crash. But unfortunately, the room is a little bit tight on this drone and if I were to do that, I would have to route the wires underneath the receiver and there's not a whole lot of room in here underneath our video transmitter in most cases. So I'm going to recommend that we route our antenna wires like this instead because that's going to allow our wires to go forward and our antenna wire to go backwards so that it can mount into the rear mount here. So depending on which system you're running, and depending on which antenna you choose to go with, make the determination which direction you want this antenna wire to come out, either this way or this way. Use your good judgment to figure out which way is best for you. And then we're gonna go ahead and heat shrink it down, obviously, before we put it on. In order for these mounts to fit over the drone, we're gonna to have to install these rear standoffs first. That way we'll have something to secure them to. So I'm gonna take two of the smaller screws from our kit and two of the standoffs and put a tiny bit of thread locker on the screws and install the standoffs in the rear of the frame here. A little bit of thread locker, don't want to put too much because these standoffs will become permanent if you put too much thread locker. Now that the standoffs are in place, the antenna mounts easily slide over the bottom of the standoffs there. And once you put your video transmitter mount, depending on which system you're running, everything will lock in place like it belongs there. Once you have the proper couch mount for your video transmitter, you can test fit to make sure that all the wires are going to route properly and have enough room. It's a real tight fit under here because there's only 20 millimeter stack height if you make it any taller, then 
you sacrifice weight like with everything. So I'm going to try to install it like this on this particular build and then my antenna wire will go right into the rear mount here. A lot of times it's easier to put the antenna into the mount first, just like this. Just kind of slide the wire right up in there. There we go. And the wire pops out like that. Put this on the back again. And then we're going to mount our video transmitter mount right on top of that. This, by the way, is the video transmitter mount for the DJI 03 system. There are different couch mounts for whichever video system you want to use. When placing this on there, make sure to line up the little nubs on the bottom with the 25 millimeter holes on the bottom of the frame. I've come up with a better solution to this and eventually I might remove these little nubs. So if they're becoming a problem for you and they're kind of annoying, you can just kind of snip them off because at this point with the new design, they're not really necessary anymore. Now that this is in place, I can test fit this receiver to make sure that it's gonna fit where I want it to go. So I think in this particular build, I do want to route my antenna this way in the more durable fashion now that I've got it in place, I'm going to go ahead and put the heat shrink around the receiver and shrink it down. Now that I've got it heat shrunk down, I'm going to go ahead and place it in place and that way I can get a general idea as to how long I want the wires to be on the receiver. Because again, if you make them too long, it's just more weight that you're adding. I'm going to route my receiver wires about like this. Snip them off right about here. Tin them and attach them to the flight controller in the proper positions. According to the manual, the white wire is going to go here. This is our TX on the flight controller. And the green wire is going to go next, which is our RX on the flight controller. Make sure that you don't have any of the solder touching the two terminals together. Ground is next. And finally, we're going to, have to put 5 volt on the last pad. Most of your digital protocol receivers are going to be wired like this, such as Crossfire or ELRS. Uh, if you are running the FR Sky, there will be a little bit different wiring, and you can copy this Mamba MSR receiver wiring scheme to wire up your RXSR if you're running FR Sky. One more thing I would like to say about receivers is if you are running Crossfire, I recommend getting the Mini Mortal T antenna for it. This is a much smaller antenna than what comes with the Crossfire Nano SE. And it's great for small builds like this because it's really tiny and you can hang it out the back and it will mount into the same mount as this ELRS receiver does. Make sure that you have this centerpiece locked into place when installing the video transmitter couch. After heat shrinking your RXSR receiver, if you're using this type of receiver, I like to route my antennas in this orientation here so that they can come out near the arms. And this will give you a very durable antenna mounting solution. Take a zip tie and mount it to the arm right about here on both sides, making sure that the zip tie comes out the bottom so that it's closer to the ground. Then we cut off the zip tie about an inch from the arm. We do the same thing on the other side. Now these zip ties can create a durable mounting surface for your RXSR antenna. If you take a little piece of heat shrink and slide it over both the antenna and the zip tie and then heat shrink it down, you'll have a very durable mounting solution for your antennas for your RXSR receiver. Since we're not using the RXSR receivers, I'll go ahead and cut these zip ties off. And now I'm gonna show you how I build mine. The DJI 03 system uses the VTX as the receiver for the controller to transmitter. And that's how I fly the drone. This transmitter can work without a receiver because it's built into the video transmitter of the 03. After you've got your receiver mounted up, the next step is to install your video transmitter. I've got four different couch designs at this time for the different video transmitter camera options. This one here is for the DJI 03 system, and it's designed to be used with linear antennas. These little guys right here. So the first thing I have to do on this is I'm going to have to remove the factory DJI ginormous omnidirectional antenna and replace it with these two linear antennas. I'm gonna take the trusty Rotoriot two millimeter Phillips head screwdriver and unscrew the top plate here. And I'm gonna carefully wiggle these back and forth as I pull up on them to release them from the UFL connector on the board. Do this gently so you don't rip the UFL off the board. Now with that removed, I can go ahead and install the linear antennas in their place. I usually try to line it up and press it down with my fingernail. You can use this method also, but you have to be very precise, otherwise you're gonna damage the UFL connector. Now that I have these in place, I'm gonna go ahead and reinstall the cover plate and the screws. I generally like to crisscross these 
as I install them. This wire, which is going to be connected to our flight controller, is going to be routed underneath the video transmitter like that. The video transmitter is going to set into the couch like this, and these linear antennas are going to curl underneath this video transmitter and come out these little tiny holes at the front of the mounting couch. So with them crisscrossed, this one's going to go to this side, and the other one's going to go to the other side. So I'm going to go ahead and take this couch off, because it's a little tricky to do this with it on the frame. I'm going to line this up to the hole, and I'm going to just kind of press it through. Okay shouldn't be too difficult to get it through there. We want our coaxial cable to come out at about that angle so that it's not pinched because if you do bend this cable into a 90 degree, it will damage the internal cables. All right, we're gonna crisscross it. We're gonna go to the other side with this one and do the same thing on this side. I just wanna push it in far enough to where this cable isn't being bound up on the exit of the hole there. And like I said, I'm gonna route them around the receiver square just like this when I go to put it in and that'll give me just enough room for the receiver and all the wires to mount in there like they're supposed to. I'm gonna set it on the, set it down on the drone, making sure that the center piece is lined up here. Before pressing it down, go ahead and route the leads underneath. And if you wanna take up some of the additional slack, it's a good idea to go ahead and twist it. And this will relieve some of the extra slack that you have on that wire by making the wire slightly shorter. Now we can go ahead and press it down with the power cables on the bottom and the coaxo cable on the top. Just like that, it presses in place. And on the bottom, as you can see, it just barely comes through the bottom of the base plate here. And this keeps this mount from shifting left and right. If you crash really, really hard like I do, you might have a little bit of excessive shifting here too. You can do something else for extra durability by taking a zip tie. You can actually route it up through this little tiny gap that's left over and zip tie lock this 3D print in place and that'll give you just that little extra added durability to where this mount can't shift and eject your air unit out the side. I haven't had any problems with this piece in the center so far of allowing this air unit to eject, but in previous revisions, I had these mounts ejecting the O3 air units until I did this center piece here. So if you happen to have that problem still, even with this mount, go ahead and put the zip ties there and that'll just add a little bit of extra durability on both sides. I like to route this cable underneath the flight controller right about here, have it come out the other side, and then once I pull it out the side here, I plug it back into the plug on this side over here. Once you route the wire underneath the flight controller, you should just be able to plug it right into the port on the bottom of the flight controller right down here. Make sure to get the pins oriented in the proper orientation. Since the pins are on the bottom, the holes should be on the bottom, and these metal tabs should be sticking up in order to put it in the proper orientation as you're inserting the plug. And press it all the way in. And now your video transmitter and your DJI internal receiver are both connected to the flight controller. And that's all the connections you have to make if you fly it in the configuration that I do. If you fly it in my configuration, all we have to do now is screw in the camera and we're done. <laughs> it's a super simple build if you don't have to install a receiver also. Similarly with the other video transmitter systems, we're going to mount the antennas the same way on all of these systems. With the Vista, you're only gonna have one antenna, so you can pick a side, whichever works best for you. And with all of them, we're gonna have our wires routed underneath, going to the front, and attached to the flight controller stack, just like that. So I have one for the Waxnell V2, Waxnell Moonlight, DJI Vista, and DJI O3. If you're using analog, there's 20 by 20 mounts on the bottom. You can come up with some solution, I'm sure, to find a way to mount the analog video transmitter if you really want to run analog on this. The DJI O3 system comes with the proper cable for this flight controller stack. If you're running Waxnail, we sell special cables in the Rotor Riot store that will adapt from the four pin connector on the Waxnail to the six pin connector on this video transmitter. Be sure to check that out in the store as you're making your purchases to make sure that you have it when you're ready for the installation. And if you're on the DJI Vista, you just snip off one end and solder it to the other side. That's video transmitters, moving on. The next step is to mount our camera cage and our camera in the front of the drone. All four of the camera systems that I showed you earlier will fit in here as well as analog cameras also. These cameras should be future-proof and should work with any cameras that come out later on, but if they don't, the way that I designed this mount, there's plenty of room to where you can create a new 3D print, or I'll probably do it for you, 
for new camera systems that might come out that don't fit in this current mount. The front holes are made for the DJI 03 system to push it out a little bit further so that it doesn't see cage or props in view. And the rear holes are generally used for walk snail and the DJI Vista system to push it a little bit farther back to give you better camera protection. Let's go ahead and put this in. The stock mounts just snap in place, just like the tank too. They just kind of lock in place just like that. And then you line your camera up and install the screws. Very simple. This is not the camera mount that I use. I'm gonna show you how to use the camera mount that I use in my build, which is for the Prospect build. And I like to use this 15 degree permanent mount, which locks it to 15 degrees, because that's the angle that I like to fly. It helps a lot with close proximity flying so that you're not flying too fast or too slow. I'm gonna to have to unscrew one of the screws in this bracket here in order to install the mount. And this just slides over the standoff and locks into place right on the side here. Just like that. We put the other side on and screw it down. You can do this on the frame or off the frame. It works either way. It's just a little bit easier to do ahead of time. All right, we're gonna lock these two screws down and we're gonna put some thread locker on two of our shorter screws and thread them up through the bottom carbon fiber plate here. All right, let's put some thread locker on there, thread it up through the bottom, carbon fiber piece, and position our camera cage like this. And let's loosely thread them in for now because we're gonna have to get all of them in before we crank them down. Now that I have both screws in, I can crank them down. Now I can unscrew the four screws out of the side of the DJI camera, slide it in place, and screw it into the two front holes on this mount. Now with all four screws in place, this camera is locked into a 15 degree camera angle position, and this protecting mount in these two camera cages on both sides will not show up in the view of the camera, but they will do an amazing job of protecting that camera. I haven't broken a single camera or even scratched one of these cameras. I haven't pitted it with sand since I've been flying this drone with this mount. And finally, on this camera mount, it's a good idea to go ahead and zip tie the cable in place, and that'll keep the camera cable from getting ripped up by the props. Now, one last check before we put the top plate on. Let's make sure that everything lines up properly. None of the cables are being pinched on the receiver or the video transmitter cables or the antenna cables. For example, this cable was on top of the TPU. I need to make sure that I position it so that it's not being pinched when I close this down. Otherwise, it could cause damage once we compress everything with the top plate. Because this mount is just designed to be press fitted in place so that no screws are necessary and it just makes the build so much faster and so much easier. Now with everything lined up properly, we're gonna line up our power cable right in between the slot here and install the four final remaining screws into the top plate. I like to provide a couple of extra screws in the kit just in case you lose one. Now the main part of the drone build is complete at this point. You can go and fly it like this once you program it in Betaflight and BL Heli and get everything going the right directions. But I like to fly it with a couple of extra TPU parts, which I'm gonna show you how to install on the arms here to protect this arm carbon fiber and further protect the motor because it makes it stick out even further. The TPU arm protectors are great at making the carbon fiber look brand new. You can always replace the TPU as it gets mashed up, but changing the carbon fiber arm is a little bit more difficult than just changing a TPU piece. So these TPU arm protectors are awesome at keeping the carbon looking fresh and brand new. In order to put these on, we're going to press in on one of the corners. They're very tight fit. So press this one corner in really hard and then stretch this one over the other corner and it'll lock right in place. Squeeze it into the carbon fiber and then put a zip tie around here to keep it in place and you'll have a nice protected arm. Repeat that three more times. Next is to take a piece of riot grip and put it on the top for your battery. And then you can mount it with battery straps, depending on whether you want to use heavier straps or more durable straps, there are different options available. If you're looking for a lightweight option, something like this works, but I definitely recommend using two of these straps. If you're not too concerned about weight and you want to be extra durable, Minute Let's Fly RC micro straps are amazing for this build because they're extremely durable. And I always run two of them in this orientation here because two straps always keeps my battery in place and it never ejects with these two straps in place. It has rubber embedded into the weave here to grab and grip the battery so that it doesn't eject. It's a really awesome design. When placing my battery on the frame itself, I generally put the balance lead down into the slot there and then I crank the battery down with the straps and then I power it up and once it's plugged in, I push both leads down into the hole here and it keeps it out of the way of the props whenever it's in flight. 
And that's one additional way that I can save money by not having to buy batteries all the time because I chopped up the leads. Now that we have the drone all built, let's get into Betaflight and Beale Heli on the computer and we'll go over a few of the steps that you need to perform before your first flight. The next step in this process is to program the flight controller activate the DJI O3 Air unit and program the ESC that's built into this all-in-one controller so that it all lines up and that way you can get the proper tune. Look for the link in the description of this YouTube video for my Thingiverse page where I will have linked all of the tunes for different versions of this build. I'll have a tune for Betaflight. I'll have a tune for the O3 Air unit with the O3 Air unit being used as a receiver. I'll have the Waxnell Moonlight configured with Crossfire, for example. I'll try to have all of those links ready for you on my Thingiverse page that you can just go and download the text file and dump it into the CLI in Betaflight. So I'm gonna quickly show you how to flash the flight controller to the proper version, make sure that BL Heli is also on the correct version, and show you how to update the BL Heli settings and dump the file to the CLI in Betaflight so that your drone should be pre-configured after that. Only other thing you'll have to do besides that is to make sure that the motors go the right direction. I'm gonna show you how to do all that right now in Betaflight. Go ahead and plug in your micro USB cable to the flight controller and plug into the USB port of your computer. And we'll go ahead and hook up to Betaflight. In Betaflight, the first thing we're gonna notice is that we're on firmware version 4.3.0. We need to be on 4.5. So we're going to go into CLI and we're going to type BL. Prior to doing that though, we need to take a look at the target firmware that we're going to be running, which is the Diatone Mamba F722 2022B. That's important when we go to flash the new firmware. After we've noted our firmware version, we're gonna to go to CLI and we're going to type in BL for bootloader, press enter, and we will now enter the bootloader mode. You should see DFU mode up here, and then we're going to click the firmware flasher tab. In the firmware flasher tab, we're going to choose release and release candidates. On the tabs, we're gonna choose the board and we're gonna type in Mamba. And we're looking for Mamba F722 2022B. That's the proper flight controller for this setup. We're gonna use the newest version of 4.5, whatever that is. We're gonna make sure that our no reboot sequence is checked and our full chip erase is checked. We're going to make sure that we are on the correct radio protocol. Since I am using the DJI O3 system for my receiver, I'm going to change the radio protocol from Crossfire to SBUS. Now, if you are using Crossfire or Ghost or any of those other radio protocols, be sure to select correct one for your setup. Now I'm going to load firmware online. And once it's loaded, I'm gonna go ahead and flash the firmware. Now that the flight controller has been updated, I'm going to connect to the flight controller. It's going to tell me that I need to do a couple of things like calibrate the accelerometer, and I'm gonna click close. First step I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go ahead and calibrate the accelerometer to make the flight controller happy by clicking calibrate with it flat on the table. Next, I'm going to navigate over to thingiverse.com slash let's fly RC slash designs. And I'm going to look up the tank S and I'm going to download the correct file for the tune for my setup, my configuration. Currently, I only have one tune listed on here and that is the Tank Tune Beta Flight 4.5 DJI DJI, which means I'm using the DJI video transmitter and the DJI receiver. I'm gonna go ahead and download that text file. And then once it's opened, I'm gonna go ahead and copy and paste everything, Control All, Control C for copy. And I'm going to go ahead and copy and paste all of that information into the Beta Flight CLI tab. After I've got it copied, navigate back to Beta Flight. I'm gonna go ahead and click on CLI and I'm gonna Command V or control V on a PC to paste the dump file into Betaflight and press enter. As this scrolling is happening, I'm looking for anything labeled in red that might be an error so that I can go back and address those errors if there's anything that might have changed over time. But this should go through without any problems with no red errors, hopefully. Now that the dump has completed, if you did not see any red text and you didn't have any errors, it should automatically restart Betaflight and you'll be back on the setup page. The next thing we're gonna do is make sure that the motors are spinning all the right direction. And in order to do that, we need to plug in the battery. Whenever you wanna plug in your battery for the first time, I always recommend using one of these short savers. We've got the Vifly Short Saver 2 in the Rotor Riot store, available at rotorriot.com. We'll have this linked in the description along with all the other tools that we use during this build. 
And also we're gonna have a link to my Thingiverse page which will give you access to all of my tune and dumps for the Tank S. And it will also give you access to all of the 3D prints that are available for the tank. As I modify and create new ones, I'll have it all updated for you. Check the link in the description for the thingiverse.com page as well. Now we're going to plug in the battery and make sure that we don't have any fires. So if there's no smoke, then everything is good. That's what this is for. This device right here is gonna protect your electronics from burning up on the first plug-in in case you might have accidentally wired something wrong. This button right here will give you one amp or two amp mode. With the blue LED, you are on two amp current threshold. I'm gonna put it back to that blue LED being off, which is gonna make it one amp. Now we press the power button, which is this button right here. And we've got a successful flight controller with no fires and no smoke. So this short saver has protected us and made sure that we had a successful plug-in. Now I plug in the battery for real and make sure everything's good. I got the proper tones. We're good to go there. I'm gonna go ahead and plug in the flight controller. Make sure your props are off before you do this step. So now we're gonna go into beta flight. I'm going to face this in the direction that I'm looking at it on the computer so that I can have the motors in the right orientation. I'm gonna go to the motors tab and I'm going to reorder the motors to begin with. First step is to click reorder motors. I understand the risks and hit start. And then just click the motor that's spinning on the GUI. This should already be in the right orientation because of the dump file that I put on here. But just in case, it's always a good idea to go ahead and just double check this while we're in here. And then you click save and it will update those settings. We're gonna go back to the motors tab one more time and click motor direction. I understand the risk and do individually. Now individually we're going to check the motor direction to make sure they are spinning the right direction. And if you notice I have the motor direction reversed and we're gonna make sure that our motors are spinning in that direction. So I'm gonna click motor one and I'm gonna check the direction with my finger. And this motor is spinning in this orientation which is backwards from what it needs to be. So I'm gonna push the reverse button to make it go the other direction. And now it's spinning in the proper direction. We're gonna do the same thing with motors two, three, and four now. So two is also spinning the wrong direction. So I'm gonna press reverse and now I should be spinning the right direction and I am. Next is motor three, it's also reversed. We're gonna switch it by pressing reverse and now we're correct. And number four, four is spinning the correct direction. We don't have to change that one. Now that everything is spinning the correct direction, I can press all to verify and they are all spinning outward. I'm gonna click close and now all the motor directions should be updated. After we've done that, the next step is to go into BL Heli. In BL Heli, we're first gonna find our drone in the ports tab and we're gonna to connect to that drone on a PC, it'll look a little bit different. You'll see a COM port instead of a Bluetooth port or whatever it is they're doing here. Then you'll click Read Setup. And you should see all four of the ESCs show up and it'll tell you if it's successful, press OK. We're gonna go ahead and change the ramp up power to 30%. We're gonna change the motor timing to 23 degrees. We're gonna change the PWM frequency to 48 kilohertz if it'll let me, there we go, 48. We want both of these to be 48 kilohertz and we're gonna press right setup. Once you've written all the settings to the ESC, you should get a confirmation that the right was okay and that is all we need to do in BL Heli. So I'm gonna unplug the drone, I'm gonna unplug the power and now we're going to test it with our receiver for the first time. In order to do that, we need to bind our receiver. I will have separate YouTube videos teaching you how to bind different video systems. Uh, I'm not gonna go into that on this video. I'm gonna go ahead and do that real quick, and that way I can check to make sure that my radio is communicating properly with my drone. With DJI O3, the first thing you're supposed to bind is the goggles, and then you bind the remote afterwards. So I'm gonna go ahead and power up the goggles, power up my radio, and once I have the boot logo showing up in my goggles, press and hold this button until it starts beeping. With a SIM card tool or a really sharp pin or needle, you can press the button on the DJI O3 Air Unit to bind. And now it's bound. Now the goggles are bound to the video transmitter, I'm gonna go ahead and bind the remote to the video transmitter's receiver. The way you bind the remote is to hold the power button down on the remote until it starts beeping. And then you do the same thing on the receiver that we did before by pressing in the power button. 
sometimes it helps to take this farther away. And now we're bound to the radio. Now that everything is bound, the last thing that I should have to do is activate this in the DJI Consumer Drone Series Assistant 2. Click on the DJI logo, click on Start Activation. I've already got my account in there, so I can just click Activate. We're activated now. Now everything should work. Plug in the drone, wait for everything to connect. When everything's connected, all the lights should be solid. All right, my OSD is working. I'm out of my camera upside down. Be sure the cable's on the bottom when you mount your camera, because I put it in upside down. I wasn't paying attention. I can flip it in the goggles, so it's not that big a deal. But if you noticed that in the video, let us know in the comments. All right. I'm going to press the Start Start button, and there we go. All right. Now that I, I can check to make sure everything is working properly, I've got a good gyro. When I set it down flat, everything's working fine. Making sure the motors are going to spin the right direction. All right. That's successful, everything's working so far. I have a video on the Rotary at Workbench channel that we'll link in the description that teaches you how to install props in the correct orientation in the right direction. We're going to be installing these props in the props out configuration. If you're not sure about the different configurations and how to orient your props, go ahead and check out that video on the Rotary at Workbench channel. But for now, I'm gonna show you how to install these props really quickly using the longest screws that come with the motors. Before installing these props, if you ended up getting the props with the 1.5 millimeter shaft to match up to the 1.5 millimeter shaft of my motors, I highly recommend that you drill out the center hole to two millimeters. So I recommend that you get a two millimeter drill bit or a 5 64th drill bit and go ahead and drill out the center hole. This center hole is unnecessary to keep the props centered on this motor because the two screws that lock this propeller down to the motor are going to keep it centered perfectly fine. And this center hole being exactly 1.5 millimeters to match up with the shaft is going to make it a huge pain in the butt to get this prop off when you break it. So just to save yourself some trouble in the future, go ahead and drill out these center holes to two millimeters ahead of time so that when you go to put the prop on, it just lays on top and helps you to line up the screws when you tighten them down. In the future, we hope to have two millimeter center hole propellers. But as of right now, this is what we have. This is how we're gonna work with them. This is gonna make your life a lot easier, trust me. We're gonna make sure our props are in the props out configuration when we install them. Then we'll go ahead and put our screws in. When you're putting the screws in, be very careful not to strip these screws out. You just put a very little amount of force on these screws when screwing them in so that you can make sure to line it up to the motor. Once I get it partially screwed, I let it rotate on its own and then it found its locking point. It actually found the hole it's supposed to be screwed into and now I can finish screwing it in. I don't screw it in all the way to start with. I put the second screw in before I tighten it down so that both of them can line up properly without cross-threading either one of them. Once both screws are biting threads, I can go ahead and crank them down the rest of the way. So go ahead and continue that for the other three props and then we'll go on to the first test flight. When doing your first test flight, never do it on a desk in the middle of a small room with the camera guy in front of you. So when I go ahead and arm this, I'm going to stand back and I'm going to just first of all make sure that they sound proper. And right now they sound nice and smooth. Nothing's freaking out. Nothing's trying to flip over. I'm going to give it a little bit of a forward pitch. And it's going the right direction. A little bit of a back pitch. And I'm going to do a little bit of a right and a little bit of a left. Now that I've done that, I know that everything is oriented properly. I can give it my first takeoff. Everything's great. Thanks for watching, guys. Congratulations on your first Tank S build. I hope this video was informative and helpful. I can't wait to see what you guys do with this drone. We'll see you next time on Rotorite.